The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, that he must be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus, turning and looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on human things and not on divine things. He called the crowd and the disciples and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a few days ago, Stephanie and I were re-watching The Princess Bride because, well, because The Princess Bride. Does anyone really need a reason to re-watch The Princess Bride? The answer is no. No one does not. But anyway, if you've seen the film, you know that the story of the evil Prince Humperdinck, who tries to forcibly marry the lovely maiden Buttercup, is being told by a grandfather to his grandson who is sick in bed. At one point in the story, the hero, Wesley, dies. And the grandson is so upset that he interrupts the story and asks his granddad, who kills Prince Humperdinck? At the end, somebody's gotta do it. Who? Grandpa's a little bewildered. He says, well, nobody. Nobody kills him, he lives. To which the grandson responds, you mean he wins? Jesus, Grandpa, what'd you even read me this thing for? The grandson is so distressed by the news that the villain lives because he can only imagine two possible outcomes, right? Either the villain dies and Buttercup gets to marry Wesley, her one true love, and they live happily ever after, or the villain wins and he marries Buttercup and makes her life horrible for the rest of their life. There's, if, if the former is impossible, then it's got to be the latter, right? But how does he know that? Well, he's so certain of what's got to happen next because of what we call tropes. Tropes are those elements of stories that uh, make up all everything and help us to follow them. All stories have tropes. Tropes help us to follow what's happening and to understand the story as it unfolds. It's like how you can uh, walk into a room where there's a spaghetti western playing on TV and without any previous knowledge, you know that if the cowboy in the white hat shoots the cowboy in the black hat, everything's fine. But if the cowboy in the black hat shoots the cowboy in the white hat, well then something's going wrong. But more than that, tropes help us connect with stories by creating and then releasing tension. They set our expectations up like giant displays of dominoes, and then at just the right moment, they knock everything down for the big payoff. For example, every romantic comedy ever written follows this basic plot arc, right? Boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, boy blows it with girl, boy despairs of ever seeing girl again, boy reconciles with girl, boy gets girl, boy and girl, live happily ever after, right? The specifics might be a little different from story to story, maybe they even swap the genders, but in the end, the shape is the same. When that plot arc is interrupted, we feel cheated. Like the grandson, we think, Jesus, Grandpa, what'd you even read me this thing for? And that's exactly what happens with Peter today. You see, throughout the first half of Mark's Gospel, there's this building tension as, G as Peter and his companions 
slowly grow in their understanding of who Jesus is. And it all builds to this point where Jesus, or excuse me, where Peter makes that confession on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. When, Pete, when uh, Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. So Jesus then tells them to keep that under their hats and then immediately starts talking very, very openly about how he's going to uh, suffer and be rejected by the very people who are supposed to recognize him and be killed. So Peter, much like the grandson and the princess bride, is having exactly none of it. Because Messiah is already a well-established trope in Jewish theology. The Messiah is either going to be a warrior king who comes to restore Israel to its former glory by beating up and kicking out the corrupt Gentile rulers, or an apocalyptic sage who, whose uh, appearance will herald the coming of the end times, or both, maybe. But either of those sounds good to Peter and to anyone else living in Roman-occupied Palestine right now. But if the hero gets killed, gets defeated by the bad guys, if the bad guys win, he can't save the day, right? Well, Peter can't have that, and so he, he takes Jesus aside and begins to rebuke him, just like that grandson rebuked his granddad. But here's the thing, right? While the most entertaining stories follow tropes uncritically and set everything up for that big payoff, the most interesting stories, the stories that help us grow as people and take us to new places, those stories play around with the tropes. They subvert them. They might even destroy them or rewrite them. Like, for example, monsters are stock villains in fairy tales, right? But then you get the Hunchback of Notre Dame, where the hero is a monster. But he's a monster for whom we start to have compassion. And then all of a sudden you get this new trope, this lovable monster. And that shows up in everything from Beauty and the Beast to Monsters, Inc. And I realize those are both animated movies, but you know that Beauty and the Beast is a very old story, right? Well, Peter is expecting that first kind of story, the entertaining, satisfying one, right? But God is telling the second kind, the kind that changes the, the person hearing it. And that's good news, because frankly, Peter's story sucks, right? It's been playing on repeat throughout history. It's old and it's tired and everybody's sick of the tune, but it never fails to pack box offices. The Canaanites are defeated by the Israelites, are defeated by the Assyrians, are defeated by the Babylonians, are defeated by the Persians, are defeated by the Greeks, are defeated by the Romans. You get the point. Lather, rinse, repeat. In Peter's story, the specifics are different, but the shape is the same, and that's why it sucks. But it's not just his story. All of our stories are terrible. It's not that they're bad or wrong or malicious. It's just that they're so terribly small. They keep bumping into each other. The hero in my story is the villain in yours. Your victory is my defeat. We can't agree on which story we're telling, and so we fight over it, sometimes literally. What God does is to step in and offer us some perspective. So like the first astronauts to see Earth from space reported this transcendent feeling, realizing how small and petty all of Earth's problems were. And that's really saying something, because remember that one of those petty little problems at the time was the Cold War and the threat of nuclear annihilation. But from that lofty vantage point, they could feel the interconnectedness of our species and our fragile existence upon this planet. Carl Sagan looked at a photo of Earth from the Voyager 2 spacecraft and famously wrote in his book, The Pale Blue Dot, the Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that 
in glory and triumph, they could become momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on a scarcely distinguishable inhabitants on some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known." End quote. Jesus is God's demonstration of the folly of our human conceits. He is God pulling us back to see the big picture to tell us a new story, to give us the perspective that as long as we live in our own little tropes, trapped by our tiny stories forever bumping against one another and competing with each other for control of one corner of one pixel of this pale blue dot, we are doomed to live and die in futility. Lather, rinse, repeat. God isn't interested in telling that same old story. God has a different story to tell, and God goes about telling that story in a completely unsatisfying way. In God's story, we do not get to be the heroes and the heroines. And paradoxically, that's a good thing, because we instead get to be partners and co-creators in God's epic of creation. God's story is life. Life that is free and abundant and eternal. Life that is so plentiful that it transcends not only the limits of birth and death, but even individuality, that it exists in us and through us and around us and among us. Consider Abraham for a moment. God's blessing for Abraham isn't for Abraham, at least not just for Abraham, right? God is sowing a seed setting up the plot arc for the next chapter. That blessing is for everyone, literally. It says that it is for all the families of the earth. That's the story God is telling. But in order to enter that story, we first have to get out of the old one. Abraham must leave his home. Peter must forget everything he's ever been told about the Messiah. We must let go of all the pious lies that we, and myths that we've been told and that we tell about God and sin and needing to be good in order to get into heaven. Those stories are hard to leave behind because they're safe and they're comfortable and they're familiar and they're satisfying. Sometimes we simply can't leave those stories behind. Sometimes those stories have to be exercised. Now, it's hard not to feel bad for Peter in this story, right? His friend and his teacher calls him Satan and then scolds him in front of everyone. He comes off looking like a kindergartner sitting in the corner with a dunce cap on. He's sad and pitiful. But what you don't see is the veritable smorgasbord of tropes and rhetorical devices that Mark is serving up here. First of all, Satan, Hasatan, is the Hebrew word that means tempter or accuser. In some ways, it's roughly equivalent to our word prosecutor. It's somebody whose job it is to find fault. Well, he found it all right, didn't he? Poor Peter functions in this story like a giant neon sign pointing to the wrong answer. He's Oliver Hardy or Shem. And then Jesus literally turns his back on Peter while facing the others saying, get behind me, which is where Peter is. And that particular verb, the one that gets translated get, is only used by Mark in healing stories where he casts out demons. Jesus is healing Peter. He's casting something out of him. And that word behind, that word shows up again in the next verse where he says, if anyone wants to follow me, 
right? Because to follow someone means to be behind them. That's the same word in Greek. So Jesus is literally, physically, placing Peter where he belongs, behind Jesus, following him, while simultaneously healing him of this toxic trope. This new story that God is telling with all its new tropes, it's what we call God's covenant, God's promise. It's a promise made to us by God with no strings attached, none whatsoever, because it is the story for which we were created, the story into which we were created. We are born to be the characters in God's epic of creation, but we choose to live in our own little limericks instead. And so Jesus says to Peter and to Abraham and to Paul and to us, with vehemence and with love, get behind me. Lent is about remembering that our stories are not God's story. The villain doesn't die in the end, but neither does he win. The hero does die, but that's a good thing. And the trope gets rewritten. Maybe death isn't such a bad thing after all. Maybe it's okay to let these stories die. Maybe it's even a good idea to crucify them and help them on their way. That's scary. But as scary as it is, maybe we actually need to exercise those old stories from our lives to make room for something else, something new and better, something that would otherwise be inconceivable. 